Now I want to take a couple minutes uh, just to ground the celebration, uh, remind everybody why we're here. But uh, again, it's, it's my responsibility um, as a representative of Garvey uh, to make sure we don't forget his legacy. Uh, we don't forget uh, him as a man, uh, his wife, um, and the organization that he created. Um, so I'm gonna share a speech that I wrote uh, in 2019, it was a couple years ago when I was the uh, third vice president for the organization. Okay, I believe one of the best titles that I can be given is, is to be considered your brother. And for that reason, I go by the name of Brother John. All right, Brother John. I'm the, I was the third vice president. I'm currently the president of Division 421 here in Atlanta. Division 421 is the local chapter of the UNIA ACL founded by Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Our division has been working on behalf of the Atlanta community since, two, since 2009. We currently serve under the leadership of the 11th President General, the Honorable Mar Michael Duncan, who is the 10th successor of the founder of the organization and the reason why we're celebrating here today, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. We are the local representatives of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. We are aware that our people have taken on several names in regards to race, from Kemite to Nubian, Negro, colored, African American, Moorish American, Black, as well as many others. Uh, we at 421 believe that we're brothers and sisters before any of these other names that we call ourselves. We in Division 421 believe that our unity is more important than the names that we call ourselves. Um, but one thing that we've learned in the Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World, uh, introduced by Marcus Garvey in August 13, 1920, is that there was a time when we had to fight just to be called Negro. And this is a part of our history that we choose to, not only choose to acknowledge, but we also understand uh, the power of legal documentation. As I'll share later, there were accomplishments that Garvey and our ancestors made during the time where we considered ourselves Negroes. And we have yet to surpass or even match these accomplishments to date. But just for the record, Garvey considered himself a Negro and I consider myself a Garveyite. Well. Speaking of Garvey, uh, as I said, that's the reason why we are here today. Garvey lives. Garvey lives. It would be a disservice and a dishonor for me as a representative of his organization if I didn't share some facts about Marcus Garvey and the UNIA. Seeing that we are here in Atlanta and right down the street from Morehouse College, I'd like to share a quote about Marcus Garvey from Martin Luther King. He said, quote, Marcus Garvey was the first man of color in the history of the United States to lead and develop a mass movement. He was the first man on a mass scale and, and level to give millions of Negroes a sense of dignity and destiny and to make that the Negro feel that he was somebody, end quote. Marcus Garvey was born on August 17, 1887 in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. Garvey describes his parents as black Negroes he described his father as a very intelligent and courageous. His father was the type of man that was, <clears throat> his father was the type of man that was willing to take chances. Though his father was once wealthy in life, he ended up dying poor. Garvey called his mother a sober and conscientious Christian that was too soft and good for the time in which she lived. He considered his mother the exact opposite of his father. While his father was strong and unyielding, his mother was always quick to forgive her enemies. Garvey grew up in Jamaica among blacks and whites and was respected even as a child. With his ability to learn quickly, he became a printer's apprentice by the age of 12. And by the age of 14, he was managing full grown men. But also at the age of 14, Garvey found out that white people saw him nothing more than a nigger. And that was the difference that he found out between the races. Garvey then became interested in politics and the injustices that were being done to his, to his people, not only where he lived, but throughout the world. He traveled to England to get a better perspective on race dynamics in the world and eventually read the autobiography of Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. Up from slavery. After reading Washington's life story, Garvey gets the calling to become a race leader. Garvey asked, quote, where's the black man's government? Where's his kings and his kingdoms? Where is his country and his ambassador, his army, his navy, his men of big affairs? End quote. Garvey could not find them, and he declared that he would help to make them. That's right. 
He went back to Jamaica on July 15, 1914, and within a week, he and his, his wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, had founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities Imperial League with the, pro with the program of uniting all African people of the world uh, to establish a government of their own. Early in Jamaica, Garvey realized that blacks did not want to be classified as Negroes, and they had rather be classified as whites. Garvey eventually got in contact with Booker T. Washington, uh, and they planned to meet each other, but Booker T. Washington died on November 14, 1915. Marcus Garvey didn't arrive in the United States until four months later on March 23, 1916. After arriving in the United States, Garvey traveled throughout the 38 states. He visited Tuskegee to pay respects to Booker T. Washington. Then Garvey turned to New York to build the UNIA under what we consider to be the foundation of the organization, and those are the 11 aims and objectives. Using these aims and objectives, by August of 1920, Garvey was able to recruit over four million of our people throughout the world to, to, to unite under the empire of the UNIA ACL. This was the foundation of the organization uh, in 1914, and 107 years later, uh, this is still the foundation of the organization. Um, I'd like to share with you the 11 aims and objectives, but first I want to share with you something that took me over 30 years to understand. I believe that, well, I know that we're all aware of Marcus Garvey, we wouldn't be here um, otherwise. And I think we're all aware of the UNIA and the red, black, and green flag. But what I wish to share with you today is how uh, these three things are interwoven to become one. For us in the UNIA, this is the holy trinity of black nationhood. As a Christian, I was taught that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one. As a Garveyite, I've learned that the red, black, and green, the UNIA, ACL, and Marcus Garvey himself are one. At Division 421, we believe the best way to represent the UNIA is to share the foundation of the organization and the accomplishments that our ancestors have made throughout history. And with that, I'd like to share with you the 11 aims and objectives of the UNIA. Please keep in mind that these aims and objectives were written during the founding of the organization in 1914. Objective number one is to establish a universal confraternity among the race. A confraternity is another word for brotherhood or collective. As, as Garvey would say, quote, uh, one for all and all for one, end quote. He says that it's our responsibility as members of the UNIA to rebuild the one body of our race throughout the world with the exception of none. Garvey says, quote, every Negro's interest must come first in all things of humanity. Not until we have served every Negro in the world should we seek to be kind to others. Charity begins at home, or as we say today, race first. Objective number two is to prompt the spirit of pride and love. Garvey says that, quote, it must be the mission of all Negroes to have pride in their race, to think of the race in the highest of terms of human living to think that God made the race perfect and there is no one better than you, that you have all the elements of human perfection and as such, we must love ourselves." End quote. Number, objective number three is to reclaim the fallen. For us, the fallen implies those that have become victims of alcohol or drug abuse, homelessness, sexual confusion, victims of Ma'afa, victims of the system, as well as many other things. Garvey tells us, quote, wherever a member of your race is down, pick him up. Whenever he wants genuine help and you can help him, do so. Never leave him stranded and friendless." End quote. Objective number five is to administer to and assist the needy. Garvey teaches us that it is to be our highest purpose in life to assist the needy members of our race. And we must use all influence and power in this endeavor. Objective number five is to assist in the civilizing the tribes of Africa. Our ancestors knew that Africa was the motherland and therefore the natural home of our race. Garvey writes, quote, one day all Negroes hope to look to Africa as the land of their vine and fig tree. It is necessary, therefore, to help the tribes who live in Africa to advance to a higher state of civilization. It is the Negro who must help the Negro, end quote. Garvey envisioned a new Africa that was capable of being the home of all black people in the world. Africa should have no need to receive aid from anyone but her own children. That's right. Africa has populated the, the entire world, and to this day, she continues to provide the world's resources. Objective number six is to assist in the development of independent Negro nations and communities. Our goal is to not have one nation, but to combine these independent nations into one great racial empire. Every community in which we live should be developed and owned by us. 
so that we have control of that part of the community. Garvey felt that we should concentrate our numbers so that we have strength to do business, to work with government, and to voice our rights as citizens. We as members of the UNIA consider this a positive form of aggregation. Objective number seven is to establish commission areas or agencies in the principal countries and cities of the world for the representation and protection of all Negroes, irrespective of nationality. This means that there should be a representative in every city of our in every city that our people live that can look after our interests. Their position is that of an ambassador of a nation. They must be aware of all things affecting our people and see to it that no one is taken advantage of. Objective number eight is to promote a conscientious spiritual worship among the native tribes of Africa. Our ancestors were aware that there were many different religious beliefs among our people, but they also believed that we should be brought under the influence and religion of one, uh, the influence of one religion and the belief in one God. Uh, hence the motto of uh, the UNIA is one God, one aim, one destiny. Go ahead, brother. Objective number nine is to establish universities, colleges, academies, and schools for the racial education and culture of the people. Our ancestors felt that we should not be satisfied with the educational system of the white man, which was devised by him for his own purpose and to lead others to obedience in his system. Even in 1914, our ancestors knew that we should not only have our own schools, but we should have our own system of education. We should be taught our own history, and we must write our own books. Garvey said, quote, the white man's books laud himself and outrages the Negro, end quote. We should not be satisfied with a college education from white schools, but we should add to this schooling, schooling of our own, which glorifies our race, for the white man's system glorifies his race. Objective number 10 is to conduct a worldwide commercial and industrial intercourse for the good of our people. This implies the need to be able to create and consume goods that we produce or require on a consistent basis. Garvey says, quote, the economic life of the Negro is important. He is to live by eating, wearing clothes, and living in a home. These are essential. To get these things, he must work either with his hands or with his brains, end quote. It is necessary that we build an economic structure strong enough to provide for all of our people throughout the world, requiring the, uh, requiring the aid of no one but ourselves. And the final objective, number 11, is to work for the better conditions in all Negro communities. This is an extra objective for anything that was not mentioned specifically. We have a responsibility to, to do everything in our power to improve the conditions of our people. Garvey tells us, quote, no stone should be left unturned. There is always work to do in this respect, end quote. And those are the 11 names and objectives uh, that were established in 1914. And I'd like to share with you 107 years later, uh, as a president of Division 421, those are still the aims and objectives of the organization. Before I go, um, one last thing that I want to share with you, one very important critical thing that I want to share with you, one thing that's, um, it, I don't know if it's overlooked or it may not be known, but it's one of, um, one of, if not the greatest accomplishments our ancestors achieved throughout the UNIA ACL. Uh, these events took place during what was called the first international convention of the Negro peoples of the world. Uh, these took place in New York in August of 1920. That's part of what we try to recreate uh, in Garvey Day. This is part of what we try to recreate in Garvey Day. The thing that they were able to do was, um, what we understand that they were able to do is establish a government, a universal government for all black people throughout the world. Um, okay, according to international law, there are five requirements to establish government in modern time. Modern time is considered the last thousand years, uh, so any modern government or nation that we know of has done these things, and this is the same thing that our ancestors did in 1920. The first requirement is to hold a plebiscite, P-L-E-B-I-C-I-T-E. -E. Yeah. Plebiscite is a public declaration by the people. On August 1st, 1920, our ancestors held a plebiscite at Madison Square Garden that consisted of over 25,000 of our people. Our ancestors expressed, expressed publicly their desire to be a part of their own government. The second requirement is a declaration. On August 13th, 1920, our ancestors introduced the Declaration of Rights of Negro Peoples of the World. This was a public declaration that consisted of 12 complaints and 54 declarations of rights. As I said previously, our ancestors had to 
fight uh, just to be called a Negro. Declaration number 11 states that, quote, we deprecate the use of the term nigger as applied to Negroes and demand that the word Negro be written with a capital N. On declaration number 53, we declare that the 31st day of August be an international holiday for all black people to commemorate the forming of this government. So on August 31st, we celebrate our Independence Day. And declaration number 39 was that the colors of the Negro race shall be red, black, and green. Uh, which brings us to the third requirement to establish a government in modern time. The third requirement is to have a flag. <clears throat> On August, we know it as August 15th. We're taught August 15th, 1920. Uh, Marcus Garvey introduced the red, black, and green flag to the world. We all carry the red, black, and green flag, but we can't separate this flag from the UNIA ACL government. That's right. We have to recognize that this is the flag that our ancestors created for us. This was the first flag to represent uh, a global government. The red is for the blood. Although we may have different complexions on the outside, uh, it's the same blood that runs through all of our veins. We have common ancestry and it's the blood that binds us. And that's why I said, that's why I said the top. It's not the hue of our melanin or the land mass in which we were born. The black is for the skin. Um, I've also learned that black's not just the color, but it's the source of all colors. Um, the melanin, black represents the melanin of the original man from whom we are all descendants. And green is for the land, the land of the original man, the land from which some of us were taken, and the land which has been divided by the colonizers, the motherland of Africa. The fourth requirement to establish a government in modern time is to create a constitution. The first UNIA ACL constitution was created in 1918. Um, we have one of uh, maybe 10 original constitutions that still exist. The last constitution was amended. Uh, we, there was one ratified, well, it was created in 2005, but it wasn't ratified. The last official uh, amended constitution was 1938. Um, next week in New York, we'll have a convention and we'll ratify a new constitution for 2021. So we're bringing everything up to date uh, for modern time. The fifth requirement to establish a government. Fifth requirement to establish a government is recognition from other governments. Um, we've documented in. Let me see, Dr. Tony Martin wrote a historical summary of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association in his book he titled "Race First. In this book, uh, it was described by John Henry Clark as as close to a definitive study as Marcus Garvey as we have seen. In this text, Dr. Martin documents that there were 271 branches of the UNIA outside of the United States. And we are aware from the aims and objectives of the organization that these branches consisted of embassies uh, and ambassadors in their respective countries. Dr. Martin writes, uh, quote, no area of significant black population in the world was, was without a UNIA branch, end quote. So, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, um, I want to say this is what we represent here at UNIA ACL Division 421. We represent the 11 original aims and objectives of the UNIA, and we represent uh, the founding of the government. We believe, in, we believe the highest form of self-reliance is self-governance, and that is what we try to practice. And as such, we, we feel that we have not only an obligation um, but we have a responsibility to strengthen this government because this is what we're going to pass down to our children. Um, as I said in my opening, you can't separate the red, black, and green flag from the UNIA and from Marcus Garvey. Uh, if we are truly representing the red, black, and green flag, we should become active members of the organization. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to close out and recommend everybody come see um, our treasurer at our table uh, to find out about uh, activating your membership in the UNIA. There are only two types of um, Africans that we consider in the UNIA, those that are active and those that are inactive. But um, whether you're active or not, we're all part of uh, this government. So with that, um, I close out and I want to thank you all for being here. Yeah.